has that. <laughs> it's not long before he needs to help out. Just need a bit of a hand uh, to see if we Filming's can... barely begun before soldiers put a stop to it. We don't want to film there the, the ship or anything. From the BBC Oceans Expedition. Oh, it is confirmed. We can have the 5,000 litres. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. How you doing, man? Yeah. With enough fuel promised for the journey, it's time to leave port and head off for the next target. It's a two-hour trip east and many thousands of years back in time. He's flying. Recent findings suggest this was one of the first seas early modern humans ever saw before making their way out of Africa and across the globe. For maritime archaeologist Dr. Lucy Blue, it's a rare chance to investigate such ancient human activity. I think it's really important wow. because people don't really understand the first time people encountered the sea. They don't really understand what they did when they got there. Uh -huh. And this is some of the earliest evidence that there is for early modern humans settling in the coastal environment. Lucy is hoping to find clues preserved here about the first encounters our ancient ancestors had with the Red Sea. I'm really finding it fascinating. It's like a big jigsaw and you've got all these little pieces that, well not many of them actually, to put into the puzzle. And um, no, I'm really, and I'm also interested in the nature of the finds because they're very different from what you find on most archaeological sites. You haven't got ceramics, you haven't got building remains, you know, it's a very, very different type of site. The hostilities may be over, but this is still very much a military zone and access is heavily restricted. Soldiers watch their every move. Wow, there's a lot of military yeah. bases yeah. there, aren't there? All of that is, yeah. a, is the military encampment. Pretty good guns up on top there, Lucy. It's a bit of waving. Let's yeah. get some waving back. That's always a good thing. Normally, they'd have to dive down to the seabed to look for clues. But here, the seafloor has come to them. Over thousands of years, Earthquakes have raised up the ancient coral reef by 10 meters. With it, a slice of history that's 125,000 years old has been pushed into daylight. This is all old coral. I mean, look at some of this. There's any doubt at all about whether that's coral or not. <laughs> Buried in this ancient coral, they're hoping to find evidence of early modern human activity. What we need is some sort of, let me just chuck a load of water onto it. Hey Lucy, yeah. look at that. Look oh, at that bit. Yeah, yeah, no, that's more like it. That's got to be. Look. You've really got the. That's fantastic. Look at that. Oh, that's beautiful. Give it a spray. Yeah, 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 look. That's what and we're looking for. Yeah, it's it's an ancient hand blade. That can take skin off, no problem. Yeah, well, be careful though, because you okay. can. I mean, and that's part of the reason that we can tell it's not been moved, you know, by water action or the yeah. sea. It's actually p deposited here in its original context because it's still pretty sharp. See, hard, but if you hold it that way, it doesn't yeah, feel yeah, quite yeah, right. Yeah, but that's, that's probably... Hold it this way. See, that's curving down. Yeah. And this is curving up. Yeah. So it depends on what you were going to do with yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, because look at yeah. that. That shape. That's a, that is a proper beautiful, that's beautiful. tool. That's beautiful. This type of tool made from volcanic glass called obsidian, dates from the middle Paleolithic period. There's no other obsidian here, so it must have come here through some sort of human action. So early modern humans were definitely here, but is there evidence of their relationship with the sea? I think that's maybe what we've been looking for. Yeah. They found what appears to be an ancient oyster bar. Imagine if you're shucking all these oysters, yeah. getting all the meat out of these oysters. I mean, look how well that fits in. You know, just... Yeah, it's cool, actually. I mean, it just fits perfect, doesn't yeah. it? So you can just imagine this whole area where people have come, they've collected the, the shells, they've processed them, they've eaten them, and then they've just thrown them on the floor. And I think that's just... It's just fantastic. You can see it in such a distinct horizon. Early modern humans were probably driven from the central plains of Africa by drought, 
they would have stumbled across the Red Sea in their search for food and water. It's very significant in a lot of ways because it shows one of the first, if not the first, bits of evidence that we have for human interaction with the sea here on the Red Sea. It's, it's a really uh, exciting feeling to, to hold some tools. And the last man to use this was 125,000 years ago. These tools show how our ancestors learned to exploit the Red Sea. For the first time, they had a food source that didn't rely on the climate. And when sea levels dropped, these thriving coastal people had the opportunity to cross this narrow sea out of Africa and eventually populate the entire world. The Red Sea has always been a critical point of communication and trade and transportation, but I hadn't until today appreciated, you know, how incredibly early that communication and contact with the sea started. Um, it just gives it such depth. That's the past. But it's what the Red Sea could tell us about the future of our oceans that's brought environmentalist Philippe Cousteau here particularly his concern for coral reefs, the rainforests of the sea. Probably one of the most critical issues that ocean conservation is facing over the next decade or so is the loss of coral reefs. Coral is vital to the health of the ocean, harboring a huge diversity of life. But rising sea temperatures across the world are causing much of it to suffer from bleaching to turn white and die. Of all the coral reefs in the world, we've lost about 25% are gone. Another 25% are, are heavily threatened and we fear will be gone within the next 50 years or so. The Red Sea is the perfect place to study the impact of warming seas. Water temperatures here are among the hottest on Earth reaching 34 degrees centigrade. We've got the monitor right here, and we're going to submerge it maybe 10 meters underwater, about 30 feet. Just off. It's winter now, and Philippe wants to find out what the corals are dealing with. The temperature is reading 27.8 degrees Celsius, so almost 28 degrees Celsius. That is too warm. That's just not an optimal temperature range. You know, it's winter time winter I don't like to see this at all so I'm a little concerned about what's gonna be going on down there joining Philippe is Eritrean marine scientist Jonathan Bokra one of the few people to have spent any time on these reefs I know basically uh, you know the coral uh, types here so this is a great opportunity for me Jonathan thinks there's something surprising about this coral and the team is now keen to investigate I've been dreaming of getting into the Red Sea all my life, so the chance to do so now is, is pretty spectacular. And then to be able to do it here in Eritrea, where few people have ever dived before, let alone filmed before, is, uh, is it's probably one of the most exciting dives of my life. With such high winter temperatures, there could be a lot of bleached coral. I can feel the water. I almost don't need a wetsuit. It's so warm. It is looking pretty beautiful. What a relief. Astonishingly, the coral is far from dead. It's flourishing. I'm so amazed at how healthy this coral looks. In all my experience, this coral should not be thriving the way it is. And you see all the fish swimming in the water column. I mean, that's the symbol of a healthy, healthy reef. The first thing we need to do is to see what's down here and where it is. 
it's just so full of stuff here. It's really hard to do this because everything's overlapping. It's so